I think the story, the story of attempts to, uh, of, of attempts to commercialize behavior analysis would be sort of fun. There's, you know, there's, there's Fred, Fred Skinner and the air crib first, I think. And what's the next one after that? The teaching machine. The teaching machine. The teaching machine. Right. I think a lot of this was driven by the fact that Ed, that Fred Skinner wasn't being paid enough and wanted more a source of income. And lots of these things, he was actually looking for something that in fact would sell. And he believed the stuff he was doing was revolutionizing many different little things in the world, like baby care and uh, teaching. Pigeons in the nose cone. And, <laughs> and, 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 yeah, and pigeons in the so and so. We could tick off some of those. I'm absolutely certain that he was not concerned about his low pay, which he did have well, yeah, you know, incredibly right. low pay for a yeah. full professor. Yeah. But he, he wasn't worried. He wasn't concerned about that. To be honest, I, I just know he wasn't. Yeah. Uh, but wasn't he? Uh, I mean, okay. So he did these other he, things because they were fun to do. Yeah, but, <laughs> and, and then he enjoyed people, I think, uh, admiring what he did. Yeah. And, you know, I think he had that kind of ego. Uh, but mon money was not it. I'm, okay. I'm absolutely certain of that because he could have made a lot of money if he wanted That's to make true. a lot of money. He actually made very little. Yeah. Uh, his his pay from from Harvard was twenty six thousand a year, uh, you know. Which of course you got to adjust for inflation. So okay, fifty thousand in today's dollar maybe, but that's not much for a full professor at a, yeah, a, sure. a, a most prestigious yeah. university in the country. Yeah. So yeah. it's uh, that man was not driven by money. He was driven by ego. Uh. I mean, you should, I should be able to deny that one too, but uh, but no, he, you know, he, yeah, he, but, he, he liked being. Uh, yeah, but in his autobiography, he talks a lot about the financing of the air crib. You know, yes. his attempt to get these people to, to do get, it. And, uh, yes, and, to get people able to use yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think he. I, I have no idea whether he, he looked forward to a lot of royalties from the air crib or not, but I, okay. I, I know he uh, he thought the air crib was good for the world. And, uh, and, and am I the only one in the, the of us that has actually used the air crib for some no, kids? No, no, I, oh, no, no. Oh no, I used it. I have two kids, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, crib baby. And yeah, interestingly, um, I uh, <coughs> just last week when I was out to this fest trip for uh, Bob Galambus, it turns out that uh, one of his daughters was brought up in the in the really? uh, in the Skinner box. Well, actually, they, they, they referred to it as a Skinner box. Skinner box, yeah. right? And he it, never uh, would have admitted it. <laughs> well, it's interesting because he said it was George Miller. Who gave really? it to him too? Right, and George Miller introduced oh, him to the yeah. That's interesting. And, yeah. That's interesting. So, yeah. uh, and it turns out that his daughter is there in San Diego with my daughter. So they're probably the only two Skinnerbox babies <laughs> in the state of California, at the, or at least the ones that we know about. But I, I can recall Julie then talking about how unfortunate it is that we said the kid was brought up in the box because right. that was not the way it worked. And she was trying to argue that we should be saying that this was the kind of crib we used. Right. And, just that, and so I think I, my, my, my two sons uh, are uh, I mean, maybe a little bit sensitive about being identified with yeah. the, the yeah. crib. But, yeah. uh, but they it certainly, yeah. certainly did did work, and and we loved it. And I can remember my parents. Uh, they asked me how long my daughter, the one of them, was in the box. I said, just until her grandmother saw it. <laughs> <laughs> when her grandma, my mother saw it, she said, "Get that girl!" Because <laughs> <laughs> my parents loved it. They said it was a great idea. <laughs> And, uh, so our, our older one was in there just long enough for the second one to come along, and he got bounced. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> but uh, how, what proportion yeah. of the day was the child in in the in the crib? Oh, I don't I'm probably the same kind of proportion any kid would be in a crib. Yeah, um, and so uh, it's not all the time, and you're feeding him. Oh no, 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 no. That's that's the that that's yeah. the yeah. thing that people have about it. That say, oh, you keep your 
baby in a box. Yeah. No, they're in a crib it, it when they're, when they're sleeping or, or even when they're awake. <coughs> it might no, be in a crib. The alternative is for the kid to be looking out behind bars. <laughs> and I always think that the window <laughs> made more sense. Um, the, uh, um, when I was uh, teaching way back, uh, there would always be these stories that... Uh, uh, Skinner's daughters had problems, and and so they misunderstood. Oh, yeah. They thought both daughters had been uh, oh, terrible you know, things were said. About and them. Yeah. Is it right, yeah. Joe, that you I think identified where those stories began at one time? You and, and and they by the way they were brought back by this woman Slater, who recently did a book called uh, uh, Inside Skinner's Box, in which the subtitle is Great Experiments in Psychology, and she writes as if. The air crib was an experiment, was an experiment. Skinner. Yeah. Oh. And 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 also said that she tried some things with her own kid or something like that, which if you read what she said was supposed to happen was just totally implausible. And uh, several people wrote complaints about that chapter and other chapters and one day the phone rang and it was her calling me <laughs> to ask why why I complained. About the chapter, it was really very strange. Uh, but my son in college, what twenty-five years ago, his psychology professor said outright that Skinner's daughter was in an insane asylum. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, let, let's correct it for this audience. <laughs> and yeah. We know they weren't, but yeah. Uh, yeah. But but didn't you recall that you identified the one source of the story in Bruno Bettelheim? Um, that was the, the, uh, the Bruno Bellheim was a, a debate that uh, Skinner had once in Chicago at a meeting uh, with Bruno Bellheim. I remember it was a, 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 a not a formal debate. It was in a hotel room in which the argument uh, uh, Bruno Bellheim. Uh, was a, a psychoanalyst, basically, and his contention was that what we needed was more uh, therapists. We need to train more psychoanalysts to train to cure all of the sick people in the world. <laughs> Skinner's argument was that what we needed was an exper was a uh, a science of behavior to prevent all the sick people in the world. And I always thought that was a pretty impressive exchange, but uh, mm -hmm. Bruno Bettelheim ran a, uh, a school in Chicago uh, that uh, was usually, I guess it was for autistic yeah. children. He was responsible for the widespread opinion that parents created autistic children. They were the, they were the fault. Right. They were to be right. faulted right. for all right. autism. Right. That, 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 Exists today that feel that story. That's and true. Parents are made to feel guilty about their autistic yeah. children. Right. Well, the issues about uh, commercializing, for example, uh, animal-aided advertising, uh, or as a uh, is an example that we tried things of that sort. And uh, one of the problems, and and to some extent, Murray and I were involved in commercializing operant conditioning, he developed all the switching circuit uh, uh, apparatus we used at Walter Reed. And when um, the drug companies caught on to the idea that uh, this was a way to screen potentially vital, they all wanted laboratories. So we gave, Murray gave all of his knowledge to an apparatus maker and we were sort of in business with him. Foringer. Yeah, yeah. Foringer. Yeah. But all it of turned, his, all of his turned out to be such a headache. And and I, I'm but thinking... We, well, we consulted with him. That was yeah. what it was, yeah. But we became sort of responsible when we were recommending to somebody at Eli Lilly that they should buy this equipment. And then Ferguson didn't come through with it, you know, this yeah. for a yeah. long time. So that part of the business commercialization, and, and the same thing happened with animal-aided advertising. Uh, we actually made, we did a couple of, of shows. Uh, Bob Schuster and I trained, uh, well I remember, we had a couple of displays. We went to a, uh, 
we trained some monkeys to go in and out of a store. We could, animal aided advertising idea was to take your, your service or your product and we would promote it by having an animal do something that would call attention. And we dressed up some monkeys, for example, who went into one store with old shabby clothes on and they came out of another store all dressed up. It was a different monkey, but all those monkeys look alike. <laughs> well, speaking of commercialization, I mean, teaching machines. Exactly. Boy, we, you know, it, 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 uh, we of course had, had built this wonderful box that uh, uh, was the early yes. mechanical teaching machine. We, we put programs in it so forth. Uh, but along, fast on our heels came the Ring Corporation, and it uh, produced uh, a model, uh, not nearly as elegant as the one we handcrafted in the lab, but perfectly adequate. And it was it was very good. And they, uh, uh, a number of people, that, it, it made it sort of in the market. It was beginning to, uh, and lo and behold, the personal computers came along. All right. and then it was really open. Yeah. It had tremendous possibilities, and uh, and uh, our old original analysis of behavior program uh, went through all each of those steps, and, and uh, uh, it was, and I guess maybe still is available somewhere on on via uh, really, uh, 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 but um, of course the the. the it could hardly get contained once you got yeah. the computer world going on it. Just had a lot of other stuff that really was not programming in our sense, but a, but a lot that was. Uh, there's this group in, in Michigan. The um, oh, I, I, I I'm missing their their name for that collection of people, but have just done but some wonderful computer uh, computerized mm -hmm. programs. Uh, particularly stuff for very young children, uh, early education, right. and it's available. Uh, um, I, I think totally for free. I'm not sure about this. The Xerox, the Xerox people. Pardon? Is that the Xerox? Uh, no. No. Okay. No. The Francis Mechner. Uh, no. Okay. No. Uh, these are academically based, and I'm trying. I should. I, I can't just can't remember the group. Well, yeah. one of the points I think you're making, I wanted to make as well, is that you you come to the point where you got to decide whether you want to be in business or whether you want to do your thing. Yeah. yeah. And that's the point we came to with our money. That was I say, well, wait a minute, do we really want to be worrying about this sort of thing? Kind of, we're supposed to be in there doing something in a laboratory. And we turned animal-aided advertising over to Howard Sloan's father. Ah. Did you know that Howard Sloan's father was an advertiser? Uh -huh. The problem was he didn't know much about training animals. <laughs> and the whole thing went down the tube, but we weren't willing to do the business side of it. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not it. willing to be the entrepreneur exactly. or anything, right. but I do yeah. want somebody to do that. And you'd like to have it done, but you don't yeah. want to do it. Right. No, I'm, I'm happy to cooperate yeah. with anyone that I can, you know, help in that line, but I... But I it, 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 and the switching circuit business is pretty much the same. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and after a while, we, had, we don't want to be spending our time worrying about whether Eli Lilly got the... And Ferguson had a wonderful line, I always remember. Mm -hmm. for, he, for, for, he would for, promise for, people that he'd have the equipment, and then we'd say, well, how come he said, I see no reason why I wouldn't be ready by that. And the answer was literally right. It wasn't ready, but he didn't see the reason. <laughs> that was, it. and he said it quite honestly. I see no reason why we shouldn't have that by Tuesday. We never had it by Tuesday. But he never saw the reason. <laughs> I always remember that line a bit. Yeah. I see no reason why it shouldn't be ready. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, but we're yeah. now back doing what we wanted to do anyway, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Oh. One of the things 
we seem to be talking about, though, is, is sort of the, the bigger environment for behavior analysis. And, and, and one thing that we might talk about, I, I know when I was a student, I didn't, I didn't at first realize that psychology wasn't all just behavior analysis, that uh, Columbia was a psych major in which we took courses that were behavior analytic right from the start. And it wasn't until I stayed on for the master's degree and the students who were coming from other universities that I realized there were parts of psychology really different from this kind of thing. And, and so for, for me, I was sort of protected from what was out there in the culture at the time. But, but I wonder, uh, students nowadays know a little bit about there being a history in which behavior analysis has re sees resistance in these places and, and the other places, but sort of, uh, how did you sort of feel about behavior analysis being sort of the embattled discipline and the problems posed? I know there was the business of starting up JAB because of the problem of publishing in the APA journals. I mean, what, what kinds of experiences did you guys have with respect to things yeah. like that? My history is a, a bit different, partly because it started a little earlier than yours, I guess, uh, but. It, the university I was in, uh, there was really nobody that was <laughs> doing, you know, was, was a real opera type, even. I did, even opera basic research wasn't being done. Um, that was Virginia. That, that was at Virginia, yeah. Uh, Starling Reed was the, our great behaviors there, and a the guy I learned a lot from, but he was, a, you know, kind of a holy behaviorist. Um, and uh, then I, I did a um, kind of a classical Hullian uh, experiment for my doctorate, though ironically uh, it used the cinnamon avoidance. Um, uh, though I hadn't read, hadn't, I don't think he had published it quite yet when I first did it. I, I wanted to uh, look at uh, the combining of hunger and and uh, what in the old world of theory we used to uh, call uh, uh, you know avoidance uh, drive and uh, and hunger drive do the two drives summate or not? That was my problem. Were those two kind of things summate because drives in Hellian theory are supposed to summate? Uh, so to get to get something to work with uh, for the avoidance. Um, I had uh, uh, people, these were people, um, uh, get, no, we, these weren't people actually, these were rats. I the rat would receive a shock. It is hard to tell the difference. It's not hard to tell the difference. You know, particularly for, particularly for behavioral psychologists. We, we treat uh, humans as models for our rats. Yeah. Um, and so the animal, if you pressed a lever, uh, within 10 seconds avoided shock. Uh, and uh, then had another, you know, it, it was continued, it was cinnamon avoidance, um, which my um, uh, supervisor, uh, uh, instru the instructor, said, you can't do that, it doesn't make any sense. And uh, I was insisting I wanted to do it that way, and lo and behold, Murray's paper came out. <laughs> and I took it in and flopped. <laughs> well, let me tell you, as long as you brought that up, I've got to, we've got to be honest about this. This is really not segment avoidance. It's Bukelsky Bukelsky. Bukelsky. I told Murray about this story. I gave a paper in 1950 at APA. This was in Penn State. Those were the, in 1950, APA was still meeting at the end of the summer in universities and anywhere from three to four hundred people would come to a meeting. It's an APA meeting. My first paper was scheduled at uh, 10 o'clock uh, in the morning and I got there at 8 when the first papers came out. Leonard Carmichael was the chairman of the session, I remember it well. <coughs> And the first paper was given by a man named Bugelski, who was from Buffalo. 
And I was there to set up a movie that Is Gold Diamond had made uh, for me of my plugging the rats into the light circuit and producing convulsions and so on. Um, when the eight o'clock hour came, and Bugelski had a whole bunch of handouts, he might say, when the eight o'clock hour came, there were three of us in the room. There was Bugelski, Brady, and Carmichael. And I was there only because I set up my machine. And Car Leonard Carmichael said, well, we had to get started because the whole day would be off schedule. Bugelski got up and gave a talk on rats that he had trained to jump over a barrier every 10 seconds without an extra receptive stimulus. These rats were jumping back and forth. It was essentially said he never published that. He did. He did? He did. Oh, yeah. Well, I have a reference to it in my dissertation. I don't remember where it was published. Well, maybe, I, maybe, it, maybe it was just the abstract of this paper. It could well That's have been. That's possible. All right. That's possible. It's, yeah. a, it's the classic example I give to my students. If you don't publish it, you didn't do it. Yeah. And he never followed it up. <laughs> right. right. That was the problem. Yeah. It was also done by another person, Peter, uh, up in Canada, the husband of that famous lady who does the left right Milner. brain stuff. Milner? Milner. Peter Milner. Milner. Yeah. Peter, Peter Milner. Milner. Oh. Absolutely. He used that procedure too. In order to he study was, something else, he never paid any attention to the procedure he was using. I didn't like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. He and Jim, uh, the guy with the brain stimulation. Old. Huh? Jim Old. Huh? Old. Yeah, Jim right. Old. If I'd been a little faster, I would have been <coughs> on that list of people who have done exactly. something that but missed the point. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Well, let me tell you the most memorable thing about that particular. Uh, session at APA in 1950, however, was that by 10 o'clock in the morning when my paper went on, guess who was sitting in the front row? B. Fred Skinner. And he took me to lunch, would you believe? He and his wife and I and Howard Hunt went to lunch. Mm -hmm. And that was the I can end of, that perfectly. The end of my career, right there. <laughs> I knew from then on what I was at. Skinner was sitting there, listen well, it was his procedure that I used, the condition suppression as the S. D. Skinner experiment of nineteen forty one. Yeah. But when well, you know him, he always came to papers and he sat right up there and listened to everything that people had to say. And uh, well, he, that was an amazing time actually. Yeah. I had that same experience when I read your paper. I said, my God, this is tremendous. Who are these people? And the same thing happened when I read Jim's stuff on, uh, on uh, uh, re reinforcing observing behavior. And I said, well, who is this guy? He's, he's, he's a neighbor. And we don't know who he is. Where did he come from? I had the same experience with both of you. Yeah. Well, I came from the Minnesota group, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but that, um, uh, the, uh, my experiment was the result of a requirement. I had gone back to the University of Chicago in the mid-40s, and um, uh, James Greer Miller had just come from Harvard. He was the new chairman of the department. He was an MD, PhD, and he put in place something that was called the core curriculum. When I arrived at the University of Chicago, there were students who had been there for 12 and 15 years, you know, working on, presumably working on a degree. And, you know, there wasn't any big rush. Everybody. The core curriculum, right after the war, what few people recognize is that the Veterans Administration really were responsible for professionalizing psychology. Mm -hmm. After World War II, there was this great need for professional people in the VA hospitals, psychologists. They didn't have any. The VA set up training programs and, and paid people to go to school to learn how to be clinical psychologists. James Graham Miller set up a core curriculum program. We were in a hurry. We had nine months to cover the whole of psychology and 
to complete, to replicate an experiment that was already in the literature during that period. I picked, I had read this paper by Estes and Skinner, what was that, 1941? Something like that, I think, the Estes Skinner paper. And I decided to replicate that for my district. You had nine months to cover the whole of psychology, do a, a, a replicate an experiment, and then take your comps. Now, I was out of there in two and a half years. I didn't have a master's degree or anything. By the time I get done replicating the S.D. Skinner experiment, which incidentally was done uh, with an average curve, would you believe Heron had convinced Skinner that the way to go was to build, he had six boxes, because Howard and I duplicated it, had six boxes with stepping switches and a seventh stepping switch that recorded one-sixth of a step every time one of the six boxes moved. <laughs> and the curve they published in 1941 was, a, was a, an average curve. <laughs> now, in order to see the condition suppression, you had to hold that paper up this way. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, it was what happens, as Mary has pointed out so articulately, what happens when you average data. You wipe out good effects, essentially. <laughs> so I couldn't get good suppression like that, so I increased the intensity of the shock. And now I'll show you a curve this afternoon that really looks good. <laughs> because I, and at the end of nine months, I had passed the comp, I had replicated the S.D. Skinner experiment, and I had four rats that were anxious. So I took two of them and plugged them into the light circuit and cured them. And I had a dissertation when I was out of there. But all of that, because Skinner came to, to a paper. Yeah. Yeah. My first contact with Skinner was based on uh, a convention, uh, Eastern Psych, I think it was. EPA. EPA. Yeah. And uh, um, I had... Uh, had a little paper and had a lot of data with me and uh, I was showing that data to some people in the room. Dick Hernstein had known of my work and had... You had mean Dickie? Me. Yeah, Dickie. Yeah. <laughs> I was telling him the other day <laughs> and, when, uh, when Hernstein became the uh, chairman of the department at Harvard, he asked me to stop calling him Dickie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so uh, Skinner dropped by my my room where I had all this data and so forth and <clears throat> saw it just had this fan folded, you know how we do this community of records, oh, fan right. folded. You. The bloody red records. <laughs> and so I got back to uh, my office, uh, my, uh, my lab, and uh, 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 and during the following week, I got a call from Fred Skinner, and he said, "You would you like to come to Harvard and work with me?" Wow! And I said, "Would I?" <laughs> and he said, "That's what I asked. Would you?" <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, you were in Virginia at that time. I, where were you? I, I was uh, my. I was actually in Maryland. I was at the Naval Research Laboratory. Oh, and you I, were doing the, yeah. that's right, the detection stuff. I did the human yeah. vigilance. Yeah. Yes, I yeah. mean, oh, that's detection. very important yeah. stuff. I remember yeah. that now, yeah. right. And I'd never had a course with uh, uh, anybody who had ever studied with Skinner or with Skinner. Mm -hmm. uh, I had gotten it entirely from, uh, uh, well, not I, I got it, I, I read behavior book. Behavior of organisms, uh, along with works of Spence and Hull and so forth. Uh, and I ha had had a learning course, learning theory course, taught by a guy named Starling Reed. You may oh, know. He was well known. You know, yeah. Oh, Starling, uh, yes. He was not at all. He was not at all a Skinnerian. Very, very good guy. Oh, yeah, he, he was absolutely. Sir, very, very sharp. Very yeah, smart. learning theory was big in those days, wasn't it? Yeah, it was big <laughs> learning theory time, and he, yeah. was, he was right in there. I learned a lot from him because he was that kind of instructor. You know, this was a small class. Oh, then incidentally, uh, do, do people know Bill Morse's name? 
Oh, of course. <laughs> okay, Bill Morse, Will Do Day. We know Bill Morse's name is the Pope <laughs> Polish. <laughs> no, the answer is no. he isn't. <laughs> Will Day, maybe familiar to some of you. Oh, Will Day. Oh, come, okay. come, come on, come on. And, and, Where the hell do you think we've been? Under a rock? <laughs> this, and, okay, but this was a little seminar taught by, led by Starling Reed. And really? He and, and, had and Morris? there were three of us in there that became yeah. that's our introduction uh, to Skinner and it's, and and what impressed us uh, was in a seminar that was taught by a Hullian, basically. <laughs> but but a but a, 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 a neglect no, more eclectic. No, really I mean, he, really, he would, yeah. he would, he would, he would a, treat unbiased without yeah, bias. He was an intellectually honest person. Yes, really oh, yes, 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 yes. When was this? What year? Oh, Did you God. estimate? It was ancient times ago, in the 50s, I think. It was still in the 50s, so Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you're probably about to be mid 50s, 50s, I don't know. There's an interesting general point here that we've been skirting around. <clears throat> your story and your story and my story and probably yours, you haven't said it yet, uh, illustrates a point that isn't appreciated anymore. The way you get outstanding work done is to let students do it and don't don't we'll make them way, don't right? make them do something that'll help you get the next grant yeah, let them do the right. work they're interested in that's not done anymore yeah. and that may be one reason why we're not seeing all the discoveries anymore that we used to see yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that, that that's a very good point and that, that's that's true is that you you, you've got to got to let people be creative in in, in oh, their right. in their science, yes. uh, rather than following your your program. Yes. yes. You know. yeah. yeah, I can think of two very good examples right off the top of my head that have been provided a very good living for me over the past uh, forty or fifty years. Bob Schuster and Travis Thompson. Yeah discovering that animals could self-administer drugs mm -hmm. yeah. and Bill Hodos uh, coming up with a progressive ratio procedure which made it possible to put those for me to put those three things together I, and to I screen thought, drugs. I taught him how to make the circuit. That would, you taught him how that, to do the progressive program, ratio? Program that, yes. <laughs> that, that, that was wonderful. But now I can give this to a baboon and he'll... We just rank ordered 14 phenylethylamine drugs. The baboons rank ordered them in terms of how hard they would work to get each one, and that rank ordering corresponds directly to their abuse liability on the street with people. Yeah. And all this was done with progressive ratio and drug self-administration. Well, you know, Two had, students, incidentally. He told me he wanted to program that schedule, and I, I tried to discourage him. I said, that's not going to get you anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to get me somewhere. <laughs> but nonetheless, he wanted to do it, so I, I showed him how to do it. Well, uh, now there's he showed me. Thing he I didn't me. know, right? He showed you that he yeah. was right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. see if they had let him alone, yeah. he just discovered yeah. cinnamon of lens. <laughs> my, my, my Norwegian colleague, Terry Sockfeld, who came and worked in my lab for a while, uh, when he started hitting on the delay of reinforcement, he, he, he was working with us on delay of reinforcement. Terry, Terry Sockfeld. Oh. And um, he kept saying that he had this uh, strain of rats, and his guess was that uh, they had a defective delay gradient. And he thought that was connected to ADHD, and I kept telling him, no, Terry, you're crazy, don't do that. And he was just stubborn and stuck with it and stuck with it, and he finally persuaded me and uh, took off with this analysis of ADHD in terms of steep delay reinforcement gradients, which now seems to really work, and these, these rats are models for ADHD, and uh, that was just one of those things where it was a good thing he was stubborn and didn't listen and just went and did his thing, mm -hmm. as, as these, some other folks yeah. did. And, uh, and but Murray's point is well taken. Be kind to your students and fellows. They could one day end up your boss. <laughs> As indeed has happened to me on a couple of occasions now, 
uh, when you teach at a medical school, that's uh, very likely to happen to uh -huh. you. The chairman of your department and you turns like, out to be one worry? of your students. <laughs> <laughs> Paul McHugh, we taught him everything he knows about, about how to handle monkeys. He says, Murray and I were written. He's the chairman of the department I work in now. Uh, Bob Schuster ended up the uh, director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Yeah. supported my grants for 20 or 30 years. So, uh, be kind to your four-footed friends. <laughs> well, and, and the two-footed ones. I, I guess, uh, I'm remembering the stories like uh, Nate Azrin's story of showing up in the lab at Harvard and Skinner says to, uh, to Charlie Furster, well, give Nate a box and that's what Charlie Furster did. He gave the box and then left. <laughs> and, 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 and apparently Nate years later would say that, yeah, at the time he resented it, but actually what happened was he had to learn all the stuff, but he had to do it and he was free to do it, what he wanted to do. And, and that was one of the remarkable things about that department was that when we showed up as graduate students, you just had the resources there. You could go in and, and there were people to help you with it. Luke Olive was the person who helped me learn programming and things. And, and by that time, Skinner was so involved in going off to colloquia and, and wasn't around very much, so we essentially just had a lot of access to resources and could do stuff. Oh, it was great. And I remember I went there from Walter, from Walter Reed. They let me go with, to, up to Harvard for, what, one, one month, two months, something like that, just just to hang around the department there. That's the kind of thing they, they did at Walter Reed, incidentally. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so Those, were the, good old Those were the good old days when Dick Bernstein, <laughs> Dick, and uh, yeah. Charlie Furster was running the lab. Right. I never saw Skinner in the whole two or three months I was there. Mm -hmm. He was away. And everybody was doing their own thing. Bernstein and Bill Morse yeah. were both students at that time together. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Skinner, Skinner wasn't telling them what to do. No, that's right. I remember Charlie telling me about it. Charlie was in charge. He was also responsible for teaching Moss and Hernstein. Yes. I always remember one of the tricks he showed me about what he, how he made sure people understood switching circuits. He would come in at night after uh, Dickie or Bill had patched up a circuit and he would take the spaghetti off the uh, cover of a snap lead oh, I, I and learned then that from him. put yeah. the spaghetti back on and then the student's problem is the, the damn thing doesn't work trying to figure out where the problem is. <laughs> so that really did happen. I thought it was apocryphal. <laughs> yeah, that story. Right. I, I, we used to yeah, wonder, I, we used to I wonder whether Lou Gallup that. did yeah. that to us. Right. But it sounds like there was a history. Oh yeah, <laughs> I did that to Bill Hodos. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had known this 50 years ago. <laughs> right. yeah. Now, the period you were talking about uh, is about the time I was there. And I had a lot of access to, to Skinner, and we were working on programmed instruction. Yeah, that was yeah. after the time I was that there. That was later? Yeah. Okay. But it was in the same general time because I, just, I know the Charlie, same character. Charlie, as you Charlie did. was pasting up the schedules of reinforcement book right. when I was there. Okay, yeah. I, I think Charlie was still in town when I was there. I'm not uh -huh. quite sure. I, I think that's right. And Hernstein certainly was, yeah. because we used to get drunk together fairly often uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and smoke. We smoked together, and uh -huh. then we we quit together about twice. Except I stayed quit the second time, uh, and he didn't, and he died on cancer. Really sad. But um, yeah, uh, in that time, I would I would go in to see Skinner, and I, and I, I was able to see him a lot. You say it was I was somewhat later than yeah. you were talking about, uh, but you know, we worked re very closely together on the on the. Uh, um, an analysis of behavior. Oh, program. I know you did. Yes. And um, the way we worked was, in all but one instance, I did the first cut at the thing, and and uh, he would look at it. And we'd get together and talk about it, and then I would finish it up. And and we were working against the clock, basically. Because he was teaching his natural science at one fourteen, uh -huh. which his program was for. 
And we have a machine, a machine wow. room with these machines over there in, in uh, you know, the building that that was put in. And I had to make sure we had the stuff ready for each point in course. <laughs> so so that, that was produced in a very tight schedule, wow. we real fast. That, uh, uh -huh. I've never written anything so fast in my life, <laughs> so, but, but that was it. We'd go in and uh, I, I would go in with the, the, the next batch, the next set of material, and we'd go over it and, and back so into this production. This was the Nat Sci course? Nat Sci was, was programmed. Right, uh, right. I, I didn't know that. Right. And uh, of course, we had to produce it. The, the machine... I have pictures, but I don't have them with you right here. It's a big box like this, and you open the lid, and there's a disc uh, in there that you and you put the uh, material on it, which is now the disc shape on paper, which is hard to produce because it's 12 by 12, and that's not <laughs> what you put in typewriters or there, you know. Um, and the, it's at funny angles too because it's you know. Yeah. It's circular, um, so the student puts that in, closes the lid, operates a uh, uh, lock, essentially locks the lid by moving the thing down, which releases. Uh, how's this work? The uh, un under this disc in the machine, there are little uh, detects around, and so when the student operates the lever, it opens up the little window on the on the correct answer and if he's got it right he moves the lever horizontally which pokes a hole in his answering ta tape which is adding machine tape really on a little window uh, and he moves it back down and uh, gets the next item when he's done all 29 items he continues to go and the ones that he answered incorrectly are returned because mm -hmm. they're, they're the ones he went up and down rather than what over and down which moved the, the little lever in there that mm -hmm. would set it so mm. well, this is Skinner's design <laughs> now it, it, you and I almost anybody would have done something electronic wouldn't we or you know electrical relays at least even now I think you're going to have to explain to whoever sees this what an adding machine tape means Oh, right. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> you John sometimes Warren. get them in stores when, they're, when your bill is being paid. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, yeah. So. John Bourne and I did it at the University of Maryland in College Park uh, with grease pencils. We gave them thing things, and we had, you know, these grease pencils, they uh, roll the uh, the tip back, there are uh -huh. 39 different colors of grease pencils, so we'd give out the form with the short answer thing and a purple grief grease pencil. And at the end of the period that they had to work on that particular series, we would collect the grease pencils, and then we gave them the answers. <laughs> <laughs> that was a short feedback. <laughs> and then we just got, and of course they did, they couldn't they couldn't leave them blank because there was nothing in there, and then we discovered that the students figured out how to roll back the grease pencil and break off a piece, <laughs> and they gave us back those, left their forms blank, and wrote in the correct answers. <laughs> so your system was better. Well, <laughs> the, 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 our system you could check the way they they could cheat. And the way you, they could cheat is, is uh, after their name frame, you skip a frame, you advance. So uh -huh. you're, so you are writing the answer to uh -huh. the previous one that you've already seen the answer. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> but if that leaves a blank space, you, you've had to skip one to do that. Uh, so it's easy to spot. It's easy but, to uh, but they, uh, yeah. yeah. I they don't necessarily to, know that when they start doing it. I used to do that as a magic trick. I used to, uh, for my Work family, every up. Thanksgiving, I, they put they put questions in an envelope and seal the envelope. And I, I had a shill. I knew the the first question that I was going to pick. I knew the answer to it. 
I knew the answer to a question. Uh -huh. So I gave that answer, and then I opened the envelope and read the next question. <laughs> and then put the next envelope up to my forehead and answered it. Uh -huh. You see? <laughs> The same kind of this sounds like Johnny yeah. Carson. Yeah. <laughs> That's what Johnny Carson yeah. used to do. Is that right? Yeah, he said, That's now here's the answer. Yeah. See if you can figure out what the question <laughs> was. <laughs> that was a favorite yeah. late night yeah. show yeah. trick. You taught Johnny Carson. Oh, be darn. How do you like that? <laughs> you were talking about your students watching out for what they do. Joe, Joe used to give a lecture every year at the medical school. <clears throat> and the students are up in this, this uh, amphitheater. amphitheater kind of thing. And he was down here on a big table there. And he took out a chicken. Where's my chicken? <laughs> right. And, and he said to, to his medical students, what would you like me to get this chicken to do? And he let them tell him what to do. And then he would get the chicken to do it. Mm -hmm. I saw that. It was an amazing demonstration. Well, many, many years later, I, I was introduced to a new physician who was treating me for things. And I said, you know, where, where did you come from? And he said, well, I, I, went to Hop I went to Hopkins Medical School. And I said, oh, we went to, oh, do you remember when you were there? Do you remember a lecture by Dr. Brady in which he had a chicken there? And, Told, and he told him what to do, and he had, had made the chicken do what you told him to do. And he thought for a minute, and he said, you know, I don't remember Professor Brady at all. He says, but, but he I remember the chicken. That chicken. <laughs> 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 well, you know, in those days, I don't know whether we're still doing it, but the, student, the medical students have to rank. Each lecture, they get to evaluate the chicken one hand down every day. It was a simple demonstration. A hungry chicken has got a lot of behavior. Did he get and tenure? He's out there right all around. Did your chicken get tenure? Absolutely. Well, and if they didn't do what we wanted, we ate them. <laughs> but uh, it was a, a really simple demonstration. It was, we had a magazine and I had a switch. The only thing the chicken had to do was eat out of the, when a clicker, when a noise came on, the magazine came up, he went over and took a pan. So you just wait till he, I, what I did, I used a, an oil cloth uh, on the top of the table. And when I was doing medical students, you know, I had the, the laboratory and the classroom and the office and, you know, all on this thing. When I'm doing PTAs, I use the, uh, you know, the the gym and so on for the class. But you just ask them, where would you like to see the chicken spend his time? And of course, the first year medical students all have in uh, in the classroom or in the library, and so you, you wait till the chicken draw a little imaginary line in front of his beak, and he marches right over there, and you pay him off. Uh, the worst one was they said, now, um, uh, this is all very simple because everybody knows that these performances are already in the repertoire and all we're doing is strengthening them differentially. Where does new behavior come from? So I asked them to pick out something that you haven't seen the chicken do, but that you think he ought to be able to do, but he hasn't done and we haven't trained him to do. Let's see how we can train some new behavior. And I say, you know, anything you want, except don't ask me to teach the chicken how to drive a truck down the, the Baltimore-Washington Parkway. I said, it takes me longer than the time we have it. That takes time. So they pick out something like, all right, uh, make him pick the top of the box, the magazine. I right? do the same thing. One day they said, make the chicken come out here and uh, and reach out to us. So the chicken came out and reached out. I hit the magazine. As he turned around, his foot slipped off, and the chicken went down, float down on the floor. And I gave a lecture on suicide. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it happens. A guy who leaves in front of the subway, waiting for someone to grab him. Right? Or the guy, or, or, is he gold diamond? Told me a good story about the, the, uh, the argument has always been that there are some things that you operant conditioners can't deal with. Can't, how do you handle something like suicide? 
And I always remember Izzy telling me a story about the young teenage women in ancient Greece. They had a wave of teenage girl suicide. And the founding fathers met, and what I think of as one of the experimental analysis of behavior members came up with the solution. They put a notice up in the city square which said simply, henceforth all teenage girls that commit suicide will be hung upside down naked in the city square. Stop the suicides immediately. And the story of the guy who, you know, attempts suicide for the 14th time, and he comes home and his wife says, you never can do anything right. It's consequences that control the, the suicide. No, you know, you'll be sorry when I'm gone. Mm -hmm. is, uh, yeah. so, but you can, you can go from opera and conditioning to anything you want to go to, <laughs> believe me, yeah. in my experience. If I, if you're fast enough on your feet. <laughs> <laughs> Did you uh, signal us that chicken. this show was over? Almost. <laughs> Five more minutes. <clears throat> okay, you have your swan song, guys. What? Swan song. Uh, <laughs> well? I don't know. Let's see. Well, don't do it unless it's fun. That's it ought to be interesting. Yeah. It ought to be. Good. It ought to be. Good. Get get something personally from what you're doing, and uh, that's fun, uh, enlightening, whatever. But you're, yeah, you're the one that matters. As Murray said, uh, in the old days, we used to do a lot of fooling around in the lab. We didn't really know what we were up to, but I thought that I would, what I would do this afternoon is show a, just the first four or five slides that, that we were just fooling around. We don't know why we were doing what we were doing, but we were sort of checking the limits of what your technology was capable of, you know. Mm -hmm. How big a ratio can you really get away with? Or, What's the extinction curve look like from a variable ratio schedule on a monkey that's been on it for a while? Geez, 75,000 responses later, the monkey is still in there pressing the lever. I'm thinking, my, the one arm bandit is the way to go. It's perfectly obvious that this is a strong, and, and we did that not because we were studying gambling behavior, we were just fooling around, you know. Jack Finley, 250,000 responses out of a chimpanzee on a three-day. Every 10,000 responses, however, a flash of the magazine. And we've got that curve. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. And three days later, he got fat. Has, has the gambling industry been moved at all by behavior analysis? Do they do re well, secret research on you know what ratio, <laughs> what way, what? What, way, what schedule they should be using to keep people right at this machine my, for my a long, long time? Was of at course the they have. I mean, but, but, you know what, the NRM bandit is, it's, you can adjust that schedule to anything you want. Those guys are making millions of dollars. But there's no journal of gambling that uh, they publish this stuff out. <laughs> jab, jab journals. Does Macy still gambles? <laughs> no, Jab has never published a paper on gambling. Yet. Well, I, I, I think talking there to some folks at, at University of Nevada, Reno, and the no. state prohibits experiments involving uh, gambling schedules. Wow! And so they can't they can't do it in the university to study. Really? Yeah. But I think Apparently, that made... they're too worried about kids, <laughs> you know, picking it up in an oh. experiment and then going off. So uh, at least that's uh, my recollection is that that's the case. Oh, I, 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 I'll bet you. Could, I, I think it's the case that they passed that law because they didn't like that it was already happening. Maybe. Because um, yeah. I think I think that the people in Nevada were doing some, some many years ago were doing some experiments. Mm -hmm. um, so you so have to be careful to... giving that advice, though. I I did it once at a recent meeting. I said, let's let graduate students do their own thing. Don't make them 
fit into your uh, grants program. One of the one of the people, one of the co-speakers with me, took violent exception to that. He's one of the most productive people in psychology today. He, grant after grant, he turns out student after student. He objected to this, mm -hmm. and I had. He's so strong. I had to apologize to him. I said, "Look, really? I, yeah. I look. I, I wasn't telling you to give up your grants. I know you've done a lot of research, and I hope you keep on doing a lot of research and so on." He never, he never got the point at all, and uh, I didn't, didn't really want to offend. Well, I didn't not, really want to offend him. They're not mutually <laughs> exclusive. Come yeah, on, necessarily. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, you can do both. Yeah. I, I used to recommend that that you should have, if you've got the resources, to have several experiments going then you should always have two or three chambers that which you can just play around and have one or two experiments which are say parametric experiments which no matter what happens you're going to get that set of results uh -huh. Uh -huh. and have something then to build on for the for yeah. the future and try to balance it out. Actually Charlie's history includes the fact that he did two dissertations instead of one. Yeah. Oh gee, I, I, yeah but that was, the, yeah we, we, we we were all racing to finish first. It was George Reynolds and Herb Terrace and Harlan Lane and me and some other graduate oh, students. Wow. And the question was, who would finish first? Turns out, I think that George did. Um, but but my and as I look back in retrospect, I, I ended up trying to submit a theoretical paper plus an experiment. And you know, talk about imitation and being the sincerest form of flattery. And and I submitted that and got it back from Skinner saying, no, this won't do. You better do another one. <laughs> <laughs> and also it was on the concept of inhibition, which also had been uh, criticized. <coughs> you know, had written about inhibition. Not, I was trying to switch it around and talk about inhibition working the other way around. The, the reinforced response is inhibiting the others. And that, that actually, uh, that language works pretty well. So I then did another experiment. And uh, wow. he had actually wanted me to do the, and I was also doing some stuff on interocular transfer, which I picked up from uh, Herb Jenkins, because I spent the summer working at Bell Labs with Herb uh -huh. Jenkins the, the uh -huh. year before, I, the summer before I went up there. That was an ingenious experiment. Yeah, it was. Yeah, hasn't been right. properly appreciated. Mm -hmm. yeah. Herb Jenkins. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 The Hollians were particularly onerous in this regard. I always remember I had a friend in the early 50s who I met at a meeting, and he said, when I go back, Spence is going to give me my dissertation problem. And that's the way they ran the store in Iowa. Uh, he, Spence and, and Neil Miller operated the same way. File cards. They had little file cards. They say, oh, okay, this is your corollary of uh, whatever the theory was. Run this one down. That was your dissertation. 